<laughs> we're going to take a trip tonight, and we're going to be in a place of Scripture where Jesus is going to pray for himself. He's going to pray for the disciples. As a matter of fact, he's going to pray for us also. And, and as, we, as we read it, I know a lot of times, just even as, as I read through Scripture and you go through your, through your reading plan, you just kind of look things over, and we kind of take for granted what's going on during that place in Scripture. So as we go, I want to look at it in the perspective of the disciples as they're hearing what Jesus is going to pray for. And, and mind you, this is the last final moments right before Jesus goes to the cross. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's pray. God, we, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we have your word, that we have your Bible, uh, Lord, that we can read your word and we can know you and have a better understanding of, of who you are and, that, and what you've done for us. We do want to lift up Pastor Pat to you, uh, Lord, that we ask that you would heal him, Lord, that he'd be able to come back and, uh, and teach this weekend. And Lord, just for all the ministry that you did do in Cuba, Lord, for the things that you just did in, in the hearts of us that we're able to go there and, and minister to, Lord. Uh, we love you. We thank you so much. We ask for this, this time, Lord, that you would bless it, that you would be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So, chapter 17, verse 1, in the Gospel of John. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, right? What words? Well, that's what we're going to look at. In chapter, in chapter 13, it really starts where it's, it's the last and final supper that he's going to eat with his disciples. And he talks about how he desired to have this meal. Just think about that. This is the last meal that he's going to have. This is a Passover that he's going to celebrate with them. And he desired to eat this meal with them. And God at this time in John's gospel is the only gospel that, that writes it down and, 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 and puts it and notes it that he washes the disciples' feet. And we know that in other gospel accounts, there was different times that, that the disciples were together eating a meal and they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Bunch of knuckleheads, right? They're sitting down and like, I'm going to be the greatest and no, I'm going to be, you know. Uh, James and John had mommy come over and ask Jesus like, hey, can you have my sons like sit at your right and your left, right? And here we have our God, our creator, our, our savior at the last moments of his life. And he stoops down and he takes the place of the servant and he washes the disciples' feet. And during this time, okay, just to put it in the, in the disciples' perspective, Jesus is showing and demonstrating what he came to do. In chapter 14, he says, uh, he, starts, he starts telling about what's going to happen. He, at, at, in supper, he tells them, you know, that one of them is going to betray him. He tells Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me. And just think of, like, think of, this is like, this is it. And everything is going in disarray. And in chapter 14, he says, you know, let your heart, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. And uh, if we go through chapter 14, verse 4, he says, uh, he talks about how he's going to go away and prepare a place. And in verse 4, he says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas is like, you're, le what, you're leaving? In verse 5, it says, Thomas said to the Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Like, these are the final moments. And it's like, guys, what do you, I've been telling you this whole time. And Thomas is, is saying, wait, you're leaving? What? <laughs> Did we miss something? And then Jesus says, uh, later on, he says in, in, in verse 7 uh, of chapter 14, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father. And from now on, uh, and, from, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip, one of the disciples, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. And it is sufficient for us. He just said, and Jesus tells him, have I been with you so long yet you have not known me, Philip? Like, Philip, where were you the last three years? Like, I showed you the Father. And they, and they didn't get it. Just think about being, uh, you know, we're, you know, next to a military installation. Some of us have been in the military. Just think of having your guys that you're going to get ready to send out and say, hey, we're going to go and advance this city. Well, we're going to sit, we're at war? Like, what? What's going on here? And he's getting ready to leave and just turn ministry over to them. He tells, tell them, tells them of, of the Holy Spirit that he's going to send and how he's going away. In chapter 15, he says, you know, abide in me, I'm the true vine. Chapter, uh, chapter 16, in verse 25, this is right before we get into, into chapter 17. Chapter 16, verse 25, he says, These things I've spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in a figurative language. And if we go down to verse 29, 
His disciples said to him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we're sure that we know all things. Like, now it's starting to register for them. And then in verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Listen, and here we go where we're going to be tonight. He's telling his disciples, you're all going to scatter. You're, you're going you're gonna to leave me. And then in verse 33, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have come, overcome the world. Right? And then we go into chapter 17, where Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, So, I got, I got the fancy red letters in my Bible. Okay? And some of you do also. So, I'm going to read it from chapter 16, verse 33, and I'm not going to read the black words. Not that they're not important. They are important. But just think of the disciples. They're in this moment. Jesus is telling them that they're going to scatter. He talks about them being, get, that they're going to get kicked out of the synagogues, that they're going to be persecuted and killed. And just think of where they're at. Like, everything we've hoped for, all the, the last three years is in this moment. And the final words that Jesus is, it, what, some of the final words that he's going to tell them is right here in verse 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Right? They're freaking out. And he's saying, just have peace. He's, he has to tell them that because he sees the look on their face. And then he says, in the world you will have tribulation. Listen, he's, he's straight up telling them, hey, guess what? This world is going to knock you down, beat you up, spit you out, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Father, the hour has come. Like, just immediately. Could you imagine? The other disciples, the disciples were probably like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, don't, whoa. Like, we don't get it yet. And he doesn't give them that opportunity. He has fully equipped them. There's, there's sometimes that we don't have the word. There's things that we, that we were like, Lord, we don't have enough information on this. But he's given us all that we need. We need to rely on him. We need to trust him. So he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That they may have eternal life. Eternal life right now. He didn't say that when they die, then they will have eternal life. He's talking that they will have eternal life, that they may have it. What is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing that we believe in the God that sent his son to die for us. And there's other people out there that think that they have an, an idea of, of what it means to go to heaven. They think they have an idea of, of who God is. And it's a false idea. See, if, if we believe in the truth and this is the truth, then anything that contradicts God's word that we have is false. So when people say, well, I just need to be a good person, and I just, you know, I just need to follow this, or I need to, you know, pray so many times, and if that's what you're, they're putting their faith and trust in, that, that's not going to get them to heaven. That's not eternal life. Eternal life is knowing who God is, the God who sent his son to die for our sins and rise again. There's evidence that he rose again for that. Verse 4, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You know, we can't wrap our heads around what it was like before the world was created. And just thinking about, you know, Jesus is, is, is there with the Father, and, 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 and you got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And who, who knows what it is? We have no idea of what that's like. But Jesus wants to go back to that moment of what it was like before the world was even created. Now he prays for the disciples. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. Out of the world they were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Just think about that right there. He, he tells them, and they have kept your word. Earlier he told Peter that Peter was going to deny him. He told, he told the disciples that they were all going to scatter. But they kept, they kept his word. 
See, I think all too often, and I know I'm 100% guilty of this, I think that because of a decision that I choose to make or the way I respond to somebody or react to somebody, immediately the enemy starts putting in my mind and I start thinking, see, I'm not a good Christian. I start beating myself up and, and, and it's like, really? After everything that the Lord has done for you, that's how you're going to behave, that's how you're going to act? And then I start to, we, we feel this guilt and this shame and we, and we start thinking like, maybe I don't know Christ because I'm not being very Christ-like. And listen to what he says. Because these guys weren't perfect. We know that. Like we get to read these things like, how did Philip not know that he was the father? Right? Thomas didn't know where he was going. Like, dude, he said that back in verse, you know, 8, 9, and we can go on. But he says, for I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. Verse 8. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For, in verse 8, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Over and over and over. What's he, what's he saying? You know, as the Bible continues to repeat itself, as God's word continues to repeat, what's important? That we believe that God sent his son. That's, that's what he's saying. And there's other religions that, oh, well, I don't believe that. It was, it was crazy because we were in Cuba and we actually got to talk to a guy that was, I mean, he had been drinking, so, I mean, it, we were going to get through to him anyways. But, you know, he's like, well, I don't, I don't see that, so I can't believe that. And we're like, just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. And he's like, yeah, but I don't, I don't, like, I don't know what happened before and I can't, you know, and God's saying, and Jesus is saying and reiterating who he is, what the mission was. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all are mine, and, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Jesus is glorified by who? Jesus is glorified regardless. It doesn't matter, Right? But in the world, who, who's the one that glorifies Jesus? How is God going to be glorified? Through the disciples. Through these disciples. Guess what, saints? Through us as well. And Jesus is praying to the Father that all things are going to happen, right? He's praying for this because this is his heart, this is his desire. In verse 11, it says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be as one as we are. Oh, yikes. That they would be as one. And in the unity that Jesus had with the Father is the same prayer that he's having for a bunch of knuckleheads. And if we look in the mirror, that's us as well. You know, in, in, uh, in 1 John, if you, if you look at 1 John, you don't have to flip there, you can if you want to. Right in, right in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse, ooh, let's see, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard and declared to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In 1 John, he, I, 1 John is really the commentary, honestly, for, for chapters uh, 13 through, through 21 of the Gospel of John. It's really just opening up what, what was being said here. So Jesus is praying for the unity, and in, in 1 John, John's talking about having this fellowship with God. And the only way that we're going to have fellowship with God is having fellowship with one another, being one as, as he is one with the Father. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Who's he talking about? Judas. Judas, right? And listen to what he says. He says, you know, not one of them is lost, except for the one, the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. It could have been any one of those disciples. It, it really could have been. It didn't, did God know who it was going to be? Absolutely. 
But did Judas have the opportunity to, to make a choice and decide on, on how he was going to walk with Christ? Right. We're not going to discuss free will and, and God's sovereignty and all that stuff tonight, but, but Judas had that opportunity. And it was all about the scripture is going to be fulfilled. If we turn to Matthew 7, in verse 21, it says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father in heaven. And listen, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Listen, he, sa he says, verse 22, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and you'll say, I never knew you. That's, that's future. Guess what? That's going to be fulfilled because it's written in Scripture. And, and that could be, it could be me, and it could be any one of us that's sitting in here. How are we going to choose to decide to live the life that God has, has laid out for us? Why is it important that we read this? Why is it important that we gather together so we can be as one? If you talk to some, some Christians that, that don't attend a, a church service, don't att attend a Bible study, aren't studying their word, and talk to them about just any, like anything pertaining to the Bible, they're going to have some weird, funky things that they're talking about. And, and it doesn't align to this. So Jesus is saying, hey, not one of them is lost. But one is the son of perdition. And that only happened because of the fulfillment of Scripture. And then for me, like, this is, like I said, Matthew 7, this is, this is something that I check myself with regularly because it will be fulfilled in Scripture. Going on. Verse 13, uh, John 17, verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they, may, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That's like one of those places in Scripture that you're like, no, 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 no. Like, you should take me out of the world. Like, why can't we just be in heaven? Like, I've given my life, I've surrendered, and like, can we, like, can the rapture just happen like right now, right? <laughs> but we're not, and we're all sitting here, you know, and, and we do pray Maranatha, and we do pray that Lord come quickly, but he hasn't taken us out of the world. Are you here sitting in a seat today? then you have a responsibility. There's something that we're supposed to be doing. If you look in, in, in uh, you know, in even the Gospel of Matthew, you know, he talks about, you know, Jesus is giving a parable of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he talks about a man that, that goes and he gives, you know, five talents to one, two talents to the other, one talent to the other. And he says that he leaves. And then that the man will return and, and have an account, have them give an account. Listen, He's saying that he has given them something and he will return and say, I want an account of all those talents that I gave you. What have you done with what I have given you? What have you done with what God has given us? And just think about the disciples as, as Jesus is praying and having this intimate time with the Father and the disciples are just there like, what is going to happen? What is going on? I do not pray that you, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That's what he is praying. Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Chuck Smith has an awesome uh, illustration that I heard, and he talks about a boat. He talks about a boat operating, and a boat is supposed to be on top of what? Water, water right? So a boat operates well when it's on top of water. What happens to a boat once water comes into the boat? It sinks. It sinks. It's no good, right? So if we look at our Christian lives, it's kind of in the same manner. 
right? As a boat goes on water and operates and takes people, like we, we, when we were in Cuba, we saw this, I've never seen a, a cruise ship. So I saw this amazing cruise ship and I'm like, wow. But what good would that cruise ship be if it took on the water and the water got into it? It'd be worthless. And so although that cruise ship is on water and it gets and does and all these things, it is not okay for the water to come into the boat. So just like he has, he, we, he has sanctified us, we're supposed to be in this world, but all too often we see too many Christians where their Christian walk has taken on the world and the world has filled them. See, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. If we go back, like I said, uh, 1 John has a commentary really about this section. And, and in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, he says, verse, uh, verse John, or 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is he talking about the world? We know that John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the world system. The love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not, in the fa is not of the Father, but is of the world. John's making that statement. And Jesus is praying for us. He's saying, sanctify. We're supposed to be set apart. That's what sanctification is, to be set apart. Jesus could have came, and he even, you know, he closes this up in verse 19, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus could have come to this world any which way. He could have been born into some palace, and what, would it have been wrong? Absolutely not. But he took the lowliest position and showed the disciples on a way to live. And he sanctified himself while he was on this earth. Not being worried about the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. When Satan came to, to try to tempt Jesus after he was baptized and, and Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, if you look at those different temptations, they fall under the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And guess what? He set himself apart from it. And we're supposed to live that way too. Sorry, maybe you're not going to get invited to that party where they're going to do X, Y, and Z. That shouldn't be something that we're striving for. We shouldn't want to be noticed in that, in that manner. You know, what are we making important? Here's a cool one. Verse, verse 20. Now it says, and, and I got these like little, little highlights at the top. It says, Jesus prays for all believers. It's just something that the, that the editors put in there. But verse 20 says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Guess what? That's us. He's not praying just for those disciples. He's praying for those that will be in Calvary Chapel, Sarah Vista, 2,000 years later. That's us. And what's he going to pray for? And he says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Guess what? John's the one that wrote this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But, but God used John by the way he writes, by the character, for what he saw, his perspective, to write down this gospel. And through his writing, we have come through a saving faith. And so what's he going to pray for us for? Verse 21 that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. What? In a group this size, if we're 100% honest, there's probably some people that have done us wrong. And do we have that unity? He says that in verse 20, that they may all be as one. You know, we could, we could expand this and, and go to like a different denominations and different, you know, things that, what are we in control of? Ourselves, our own actions. What about those people that have done us wrong? Are we trying our best to try to, you know, like Romans talks about, at, at, at whatever you can, be at peace with all men? Is that the cry of our heart? Or do, does somebody do something to us and we're like, you know what? 
I'm just not going to attend Saturday night service. I'm going to go first service Sunday. I'm not going to no longer sit on that side of the room. I'm going to sit on this side of the room. No offense, Andy, but... You know, you know what I mean? Are we, are we as one? And then what's it say? Why is it so important that we would be as one? If we look at the last section, it says uh, that the world may believe that you sent me. How is the world going to ever know that Jesus is who he said he was through this? Are we going to just give somebody the Bible and like, hey, just believe this, bro, it's true. It's like those... I don't mean to call anybody out. But it's like somebody that has weight, you know, gym equipment in their house, like, yeah, I work out all the time. But they're like, you can clearly see that they don't work out. It's like, <laughs> just because it's sitting in your house, bro, doesn't mean that you've picked up that weight. What good does it do? Hey, it's going to be by the way that we live it out. You know, if we go back to where, where I said in Matthew, uh, Matthew 7, verse 21, where, where they're like, where they're telling Jesus, you know, but wait a minute, but we cast out demons in your name and we prophesied in your name and we did all these miraculous wonders in your name. Listen, that's what they were banking on for them to go to heaven. They thought that they were indebted because of the things that they did that Jesus was going to give them a pass and be like, wow, look at all that you've done. Come on in. Listen, what to, listen to what they didn't say. They didn't go up to Jesus and say, what do you mean, depart from you? But, but when I sinned, I, I repented. But when I did things that were wrong and I, and I noticed that there was distractions in my life, Pastor Dwight was talking about distractions, right? When there's things that have distracted my life that have drawn me away from you, I've repented of those things and I've asked for forgiveness. And I've cut those things. They didn't say that. They were more, for, more focused on the things that they did in the name of Jesus than in the fact of knowing Jesus. That was one of the huge things for, for when I got saved and, and, and I surrendered my life. My neighbor told me, you know, well, you know, where's your relationship with God? I was like, oh, I know Jesus. Went to church growing up, was, a, you know, served in it. And he's like, mm, you know about him, but you don't know him. And I was like, yeah, you're right. We're supposed to demonstrate to the world the goodness of God. And if we're supposed to send and deliver a message that Jesus died for the sins of the world, for the forgiveness of sins, but yet somebody does something wrong to me and I can't keep my mouth shut about what they've done to me, I haven't forgiven them, what message are we portraying? Oh, that Jesus can die for the whole world, but his sacrifice on the cross isn't good enough for the person whose weeds are like growing into my yard and they won't cut it down? Seriously? Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Am I portraying that to my wife? Is that something that, I, that's something that I'm supposed to be doing? There you go again in Ephesians. Don't provoke your kids to anger. Am I a, a, a mean dad that's just like rough and, I, and I, I put my kids into that spot and I've like cornered them in this place where they just, they just hate everything about coming to service, coming to church, just hate being in the house? I'm supposed to be displaying, as a leader of my family, that is my role. And as Christians, guess what? The world isn't going to hear the message. They're going to they're gonna listen, they're going to hear it, but they're going to watch you do it. The disciples saw it, heard Jesus. He was going to go to the cross. He was going to leave. It didn't sink in until all this stuff was going on. It wasn't until Jesus got down and started washing their feet. They're like, whoa, what? He told them, I didn't come to, to be served. I came to serve. And he demonstrated it. And so how are we going to show the world that the message of this is true? You know, Pastor Pat, I got to see him do uh, pretty much every single pottery presentation except for one of them. Um, but, you know, he's, he's, he's molding and shaping the pots. And he, he talks about a certain one where he's like, you know, this is like that pot where, you know, in your Christian walk where you want enough Jesus to keep you from hell, but you don't want enough of him that he's going to change your life. Born again, guys. That's what the message of being born again is. I'm not that same person.
verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Oh, enough already, Jesus, we get it. Right? But he repeats it over, because why? This is the hardest thing that we have. This is probably the hardest thing to do, is to give, forgive somebody. To try to be as one with other people, even though we don't agree with them. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect and one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. There we go, just that same message. What message are we showing? There was a, I was, in reading, uh, you know, studying for this, I was reading Warren Wiersbe. And he talks about Judas. You know, if we go back to where, you know, he talks about there was, you know, there was only one and it was in fulfillment of the scripture, who's lost, right? And then now, right now, Jesus is praying for us. And he's talking about unity and all these other things. Listen, listen to what he said about Judas. He said, Judas is not an example of a believer who lost his salvation. He is an example of an unbeliever who pretended to have salvation, but was finally exposed as a fraud. Mm. This word tells me how I'm supposed to live my life. And Jesus is talking about being glorified. When he prayed to the Father, he's like, glorify your son so that you will be glorified. He talked, he talked here that, that, that through us, he says, you know, that we would be made perfect and that the world may know that he, that he has sent us. And that we have the love of the Father. Judas didn't have that. He was faking the funk. Are we doing that? You know, a lot of times we just come to church and we just, we plop down or we come here like coffee shop. I got my free coffee card and I'm going to get my stamp and I'm going to get the free coffee and uh, I want the big one because I normally don't order that one, but I got the big one. You know what I mean? I got all the bells and whistles. I'm down it and then I'm going to sit here in church and I'm just going to sit down in my seat. Nobody better be in my seat. And we treat this. We, we, we treat this. Listen. We treat this as if it was a cruise ship. Listen, it's not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. And there's a, there's a fight out there that we're supposed to be taking part in. It's not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. And we need to man our stations. We need to man our posts. And we need to man them at work, at home. He says, you know, he prays that, that you know, I don't pray for them to come out of the world, but I pray that you keep them from the evil one. How's he going to keep us from the evil one? See, when I start listening to other people's advice on how I should deal with the situation who aren't believers, and we start getting that advice, or we start opening up, you know, you open the newspaper and you're like, oh, what's my horoscope say today? <laughs> and that's what you're getting. Guess what? You're not being, he can't keep you from the evil one. You're not giving anything. When, when Pastor Pat was like, hey, you know, I you know, want you to teach and, 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 and gave me some advice and, and, and was kind of like pouring into me, he told me, he said, look, you pray and you study and you ask God to bless it. He says, and he will bless what you give him. If you only study just a little bit, that's all he's going to be able to bless you with. But if you study, you pray, you give him so much, he will bless all that you're able to give him so that he can bless that. So you want to be kept from the evil one? You have things in, in your life that are going wrong? You kind of have to take a step back and wonder, what am I doing? What am I focused on? And hey, I know it's Thursday night. Like, you're going to come back to service again this weekend more than likely. Like, all right. But that's not a pattern on our back to say that we got a gold star and we're the rock stars of, of Calvary Chapel, Sierra Vista. Hey, you know what? We all need his word. We all need to be united as one. We all need the message. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, that these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love which, which you love me may be with, may be in them and I in them. The love that the Father has for Jesus is supposed to be in us. And we're supposed to have Jesus in us. 
Paul says, be imitators of God. I have a clear description of how Jesus lived his life, and that's what I'm supposed to follow. And I, I can just pray that, Lord, just let me walk in your footsteps today. You know, let me have that grace and that mercy and the forgiveness that you had for, for those who, who persecuted you or, or for, for those in general. Let me have that same love. Let me be able to pass that on just as you did. You know, as Christians, we're, we're supposed to be putting the Lord on display. And Jesus put God on display. He went to the cross. He suffered. And he's on the cross, nailed to the cross. And the first thing that comes out of his the first thing he says, this is, this is Jesus being able to put him on display. What's he say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. That's deep. You read that, you're like, wow. Like, I don't know how I would. Listen, not only is that deep, but that is so biblical. If you go back to the law, it said, if anybody commits a, a murder, not know, an accidental murder, not knowing, right? Not knowing what they did, that it caused, some, it caused harmful death to a person, that murder is not held account. They're not held accountable for that murder. So when Jesus is on the cross, guess what he's saying? They don't know what they're doing. This is an accidental murder. He says, I came to fulfill the law. He fulfilled it. And, and, and our prayer as, as we read through this is just, man, Lord, let that just penetrate my heart. Change me. Man, it was amazing just watching, watching the, the pottery presentation and all those things. And, and I just remember, you know, lots of different, different things. You know, but Pastor Pat, he gets finished. He makes this pot, right? And he shows the clay and he tells them, you know, you, know, you see yourself up here. Where are you? And in that moment, the Lord spoke to me. And he's like, yeah, but that pot's not finished. Even the vase, even the vase that he made, or that cereal bowl that he made, it's not finished. What's it need to be finished? Glazed. It needs to be glazed and fired. That test, in, in 1 Peter, it talks about, you know, that our faith is, is more precious than gold. It talks about the fire that, that gold goes under and it, it gets skimmed for, for impurities until it gets... It says that, you know, they, they didn't have, you know, all this technology that, that we have nowadays. But what they did have is as that gold was, was being put hot and they would skim off all the impurities, they said that the test of, of knowing that that gold was done is when that person could see the reflection in that gold. God is, is working in our lives and it's not until he sees his son in our lives. And let that be the prayer for all of us.